So I know this is, a, this is a long session, but if you are going to miss one talk, the next talk is not the one to miss. Um, my friend Pete Leiden uh, tracks and, and uh, works on observing social and political trends in a way that uh, I think you'll find insightful and fascinating. Pete. All right. Ooh. Thank you, Drummond. Uh, I am a little bit of an oddball here. I'm going to be talking a little bit about how the themes we talk about today come together. But I'm really going to pull back in a very big way here into the big picture of what I call here the Obama moment. It's not about Obama, but it's about the moment in history this he may be helping catalyze through the help of all of us here today. It's an historic time for transformation. We've heard this over and over again. I want to give you a little round of like how big a deal this actually might be. Let's take Barack on his word that he is this, America, this is our moment. It's an extraordinary historic moment. Well, what does he actually mean by that? Well, I take what he means by that is there's been a, basically a series of times in American history, a handful of times where we've watched explosive political innovation. About 10 to 20 years of an explosion of political innovation. We saw it in the early 19th century. This is Jefferson with the Revolution of 1800 democratize the country in a very leap forward from what we had in the early part. We even made reference here to the incredible progressive kind of explosion around the Civil War. We saw it at the beginning of the 20th century, Teddy Roosevelt, and ultimately with, with Wilson. And we saw it basically in the middle of the century with FDR. There's been a few times where our old politics have broken down, the new challenges of the country have come about, and there have been these explosive periods of innovation. The two main things that happen in these situations is we, the country goes through such deep structural changes economically and society, in a social way that they have, the old politics doesn't work, you have to do something different. That's one thing that happens. The second thing that happens is often the country is faced with unprecedented challenges, we don't know how to deal with them, and we have to do, have a ton of different innovative ways to take on the next challenges. The other thing that's happened, and this is I helped develop with um, Simon Rosenberg, for those who know you, when I was at the New Politics Institute, when you track these things, there's actually three things that often always come together. There's a, either a new set of technologies and media that basically come together in these periods. You have a new configuration of the population of the country through immigration and basically through generational change. And you also watch a, many, a ton of new ideas about how we can solve the challenges of these unprecedented challenges. Now, to kind of give you a sense of how that works, at the early part of the 20th century, we were going from an agricultural, we had gone from an agricultural society to an industrial society, from a kind of rural society to an urban society. And the old politics around that completely broke down. And what you saw was the explosion of what we think of now as the classic progressive era. It was essentially a period, again, 10 to 20 years, started with F, uh, Teddy Roosevelt there, but basically ended it later with Wilson. Again, their three transformational pillars, the same thing happened. They had, for the first time, we actually had urban uh, mass production, basically, on uh, newspapers. It actually got out the word in a, a different way we could really take newspapers to a whole new level, which I, I was able to do that. We also had, had saw women and the European immigrants come together in a new way that basically forced for big change. And we actually watched a whole bunch of new ideas of how we democratize and humanize the economy. And so what you happened by the end of this explosive era, you actually watched things. We busted up the, the robber barons. We basically you know, brought in about a progressive income tax. There had been no income tax before there. We, walked, we unionized workers. We basically brought the women's vote together, child labor ends, FDA standards for, for food and that. But anyhow, we had an explosion of these new things. This is what the classic period. The second period, which is more familiar to us, is what happened with FDR and the mid 20th century thing. That was more of a secondary kind of way to think about it. A second way of thinking about it is we were facing challenges we had no idea how to solve. The Great Depression, rise of Hitler, uh, organized totalitarian communism, we just didn't know what the heck to do here. And so they had those same three pillars. They had radio and early broadcast technologies. They, t they had a new coalition of politics, unions of big cities. They came together, and they had a new set of ideas for how we were going to deal with these things. And so what you saw in the spirit of literally 15 years, we watched essentially a way to use government to get our country out of the depression. We saw we, ways to, new ways for defense to actually save the world for democracy. We figured out a whole, we started like the, everything from the United Nations, World Bank, IMF. And ultimately, we, coming out of that, we kept going with the GI Bill, et cetera, et cetera, into the Great Society eventually, which is still the pile of that. And anyhow, we had an explosion of this creativity which set up the world which we f we're still living on today. This is about a 50 to 60 year run on essentially the system they innovated in the middle of the century. So what's 
our era's time has come. This is essentially, I think, the central idea that essentially a Brock is tapped into. And the thing that's happened here with our technology is we are watching such a fundamental shift with computer technologies and the telecommunications revolution of the internet. It is essentially restructuring our world in such a fundamental way. We are watching a globally interconnected society happening right in front of our eyes. It is reworking every system we're basically up against right today. And we're watching the birth of this new thing that we ha can't really figure out. And we're also doing at the same time this simultaneous challenge of all these incredible challenges we've never faced before. I mean, global warming to be just one of them, but look, you know, there's tons of them. If you basically go, boom, talk about global warming. <laughs> Every one of these challenges are huge challenges, extremely complex challenges. All of them have to be figured out in the next 20 years. This is essentially up to any other era's challenge of the American history. We are up against it right to now. So our political transformation luckily has the same three pieces. We have got, in fact, the best tools we could ever put, the computer, Internet revolution is, bar none, the biggest transformation we've seen going on in this country, certainly on a par with anything else. We are watching, by the way, you talk about the immigration. We are going through the biggest immigration infusion in this country since the beginning of the Ellis, since the Ellis Island days, really. The levels of immigration, in terms of percentage, are roughly comparable. That's why part of what's happening with the, t the tension in politics now. Huge. And the second thing that's going on is we're watching a generational change on, again, a scale we've never seen. The biggest generation in American history is the, the millennial generation. They're 29 and under right now. It is bigger than the baby boom, and these kids are ready to rock, which we're seeing in politics now. And the second, the th final thing, which is the least developed, is what are we going to do about all these 21st century challenges? And I'm going to talk about that in a minute here. The thing you've got to understand here about Bar Bar Barack's rise, though, is that we are watching a fundamental paradigm shift in politics. This isn't just a charismatic guy. He is doing something here that is changing the face of politics. Let me explain how this works. Ha it has to do with the tools. If you understand how politics, and I've spent the last three years here at the New Politics Institute trying to figure this out, the way politics worked ever since this guy, JFK, started with broadcast television is three, there are three ways to go. Three ways that you had to have to win in politics. One is you had to raise money from wealthy people or special interests, which essentially were corporations or big unions. The only way you could aggregate big money. The second thing is you had to have control of the party establishment to basically win any kind of campaign and you basically had to master broadcast television. If you had these three things covered, you basically won in politics. And that's why party insiders always won this thing. The people who raise the most money won TV manipulated for the last 50 years. And that's also why the conservatives and Republicans were kicking the butts of the pro progressives by the end of this, because they had this figured out in a way that we basically didn't until four years ago. And basically, it's in the last cycle here. It's really come to a fruition. Howard Dean basically figured it out. He's the first renegade outsider from Gary Hart, Bill Bradley, all these guys tried. It was finally Dean that said, you don't have to be the insider to figure this out because you can use technology to do three things different. You can start a new paradigm in politics. That new paradigm is this. Basically, the new model is completely inverts the old model, basically. The first thing is you say you don't have to raise from just wealthy people and corporations. You can really tap into many, 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 many middle class people to do it. Fundamental shift this, uh, through technology. The second thing is you, go, you don't need the party. You can actually use decentralized outsiders to actually win in politics, again, using technology. And the third thing is you start to use the new media of the web and the internet. And this is the thing that he was able to do. But in fact, if he could do it, the guy who figured it took it to the higher level is Barack. And as much as I know there's people on both sentiments here, both sides of the party here, and we had a very internal struggle here, Hillary Clinton ran the best old campaign that has ever been seen in Democratic circles, bar none. She did all those th first three things perfectly. She had all the party locked down, she had all this, this, uh, the kind of big money locked down, and she had the team that could master po uh, TV. He basically took the other model and was able to beat her. McCain, on the other hand, <laughs> is a complete cycle behind. Which basically is something we'll come back to in a little bit. Now, I want to just give you a little more sense of this political paradigm shift. Paradigm shifts, I come out of the tech world. Paradigm shifts are when you have a new technology, it completely changes the game in such a way that you essentially it's a new paradigm of operating. When that happens, the old thing quickly falls, the next thing wins, or the next thing happens. This is what's happening in politics right now. And I'll explain how that works. I gave you a little flicker. I'm going to give you a little more data on this. The f paradigm shift in fundraising from the fat cats, essentially, to many, many people is huge. And look at the numbers in this. This will just give you a sense of how powerful this is. This is how the fundraising for Clinton, Barack Obama, and John McCain from the first quarter of last year, 2007, that's McCain, the little, uh, the little gray one there, 
Uh, Barack, Barack, and, Barack and Hillary were pretty much neck and neck through all four quarters, roughly, of this year. And then came January, and that's when people came out. Boom, look at Barack's numbers go, look at Barack's numbers go, look at Barack's numbers go. That's three months. So you put those big purple things on top of each other, those last three, it would be through the roof. That's what happened with this new model of fundraising. Now, the power of this actually is very, very powerful, because if in the old days, you basically took 100,000, you know, took everyone maxing out on their contributions. For those that know politics, that's the most you can contribute. You can still raise a lot of money. The problem is, or the thing is, Barack basically has one, had 1.5 million contributions. He's able to actually outraise them. And again, this isn't just an average we're just throwing out there. This isn't actually the fact. This is more graphic on this. The thing is, in the general election here, he'll easily be able to get 5 million people at least 100 bucks. You could actually start to get half a billion dollars, which is why he turned down public financing, and this is something we can debate later, but the thing is, in technology, once you crack the new technology and the new mindset, there is no, it's super easy to scale. So it is very possible that you could imagine, actually, the money going in politics could go way, way, way more than we've ever actually seen it. Now, we won't go there, but uh, for now. But I want to basically say, the shift, the paradigm shift in organizing, again, using technology, what has happened here? Why is everyone turning out in such crazy ways? This is, the, you know, basically this, this is not the end of the primaries, but from 2004 to 2008, that's what happened in Democratic turnout. From two, and with re, between the Republicans and the Democrats, it ultimately was doubled. So we doubled what the Republicans could do, and we actually doubled what we even ourselves did in 2004. That wasn't just because people are interested in politics. They were interested in 2004. It's because of these tools. Millennials, young people who use these new tools, doubled and even tripled their turnout from 2004 to 2008. This thing is a really powerful tool. And why is it? Because you're using new technologies to do the good old-fashioned politics. It's also, you're starting to use these. This is MyBarackObama.com. If you haven't gone there, check it out. 800,000 people now are actively working on that right now. And this is what happens. As much as two cycles ago, you literally have campaigns that were run by a small little centralized staff of 2,000. It's possible, and again, this is Simon Rosenberg helped me, helped me understand this. It's very possible that this year we're going to see maybe close to 2 million people working on Brock's campaign. Not on staff, but through this kind of network. Like I said, we've already got active almost 800,000 to a million right now going for it. Now, the final paradigm shift here is in media. And this is a big piece. I, I'll go quickly on this, though. This is Brock's, this is like, again, this is in April numbers here of how many YouTube views are going on. Again, how he was dwarfing Hillary and, of course, blasting away McCain. Um, <laughs> But the thing is, this is starting to, this is a big deal, because the thing is, with, with it, unlike 30-second television ads, which Frank, granted still get many more eyeballs, this is a different thing that goes on with video. First of all, everyone who's engaged is active. You can go as long as you want. It goes literally, every one of Brock's top 10 videos have gone 10 minutes or more, the average. And you do not get a view. It, it's not counted as a view on YouTube unless you watch the entire thing. So he has just done astounding in this. And anyhow, there's all these different ways that this is vastly superior. But the big paradigm shift in new media is that this is the thing that people, it's produced for free, it's distributed for free, you can look at it locally, nationally, and globally at the same time. If you had to do this in television, you would, you, you would you'd die basically trying to basically go get a global television buy. How would you do that? And this is just the average thing that happens with the thing. This is what they call a paradigm shift. This is why this is vast and superior. This is why the politicians that use it are basically winning. And so what's happening is you're watching this old paradigm that was done around wealthy money to the many people or for fundraising, having to control the party to now controlling basically people outside the party and ultimately going from television to politics to the web politics. This is the paradigm shift. Now, it doesn't mean you give up on the other side. Barack's doing all three. He's still doing it in traditional sides. But what gave him the strategic advantage was the other thing. Now, McCain is a cycle behind. So he is going to basically, <laughs> I'm going to tell you here, for a lot of reasons, Barack Obama is going to just destroy McCain this fall, I think. Now, that doesn't mean we should be overconfident. But this is, if you look at the bigger context here, it's, it's the old politics versus the new. Now, I want to kind of shift here and kind of wind it down here as fast as I can with the big problem with for progressives is what are we going to do when we come in with a new president, bigger margins in the Congress, and really the task our hands to take on this historic challenge I just talked about. What are we going to do now? What are we going to do about global warming, the most complex problem we've ever faced? What are we going to do about this decentralized terrorism? We haven't figured it out. What are we going to do about the global economy? They ain't going away. This is a huge situation. Now, 
I'll make this historic parallel. What did FDR and those guys do? They didn't have a clue. I'm telling you, when, when FDR, this is a great book, by the way, by Jonathan Alter, it just came out two years ago. It relives those first 100 days. He had no idea what the New Deal was when he was campaigning. They wrote it on an envelope, you know, before a rally. They came in the on his inauguration day, they shut down the banking system for the next 10 days, and they basically said, get me everybody who knows anything about banking in a room, and let's figure this thing out. And basically, they had a moratorium on banking until they could just start throwing stuff up and trying it. It was basically, they didn't know the ideas, but they had a rapid attitude of experimentation, rapid kind of um, trial and basically innovation, basically, is what they did. They used the technologies and the resources at their disposal, which meant they bought a bunch of white guys in a room and they used chalk. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> what they did. <laughs> By the way, for those of you who actually know a little bit about this, this is Vannevar Bush, the guy who was, uh, was, was uh, uh, FDR's chief science advisor who envisioned, is the guy who's actually attributed now to envisioning the, what the web could be, this machine, a thinking machine he thought that could tie all the world's information together. But it was a distant dream at that time, just to remind you. Anyhow, in 15 years, they went through that and they made a, literally a world historic accomplishment. They did in 15 years, built the system that we're still living on today. IMF, World Bank, all the stuff we know is a basically the fundamentals of how the global economy and the global world works, the power shift of everything, of the power dynamics, it's their world. We can do better. So, because what we've got is we've got this digital revolution, we've got the internet. I'm telling you, the tools we have at our disposal are just monumentally different. Now, I want to just kind of drive it home here. The thing we have not seen, when, when Brock says we're going to change the business of Washington, he's totally right. We've got to get money out of Washington, all that kind of stuff. What hasn't happened is this paradigm shift in the ideas business, the think tank world, how we figure out what we're going to do, policy, basically. The old model of policy is it's very similar to the old model of politics. It's all supported by high net, really wealthy folks or corporations. That's, that's the only people, basically, who fund think tanks. It's done by a few elite insiders. They're all inside Washington. They go in and out of administrations. They basically keep recycling the same ideas. And they basically, the basic way they do it is meetings and white papers. I spent the last three years, a lot in Washington. It's still run the same way. The new model of pod ideas would say, hey, why don't we tap into all kinds of people who have no special interest to basically, if you're a telecom com company putting into a think tank, they're going to kill basically anything to do with changing telecom. Or if you're an energy company putting into a think tank, you aren't going to see anything about solar energy right in there. That's why we got to basically get that out of the think tanks. You also can scale up a much larger network. And you basically can also start to leverage the new tools. So here's the thing about technology's ability to scale is basically, once you get the technology and mind shifts up, as I said before, with funding, you know, you could basically go from, that's the high net worth folks that might pull something together. This is the model that basically corp corporations do to fund think tanks. But here's it, you could start to actually do a different way to do it. Now, not only could you get funding like this, but why do you only have five fellows in Washington thinking this through, or even 100 at most, which is the biggest ones have? Why can't you tap into the genius American people from all over the place. Now, the second thing that happens about politics or computers is parallel processing. You don't centralize everything, you break it down and you figure it out and then you reassemble it. That's why Google basically runs these server farms and all. So what do you do about basically all these problems we talked about? Well, one way to start to think about solutions is uh, you take all those issues and you start to break them down. You take it even in clean energy, for example, there's all these sub-issues you've got to figure out. How are we going to do about mass efficiency, solar, how do you get transport, what are we going to do about grid storage? These are all huge challenges that have to be figured out 20 years to do it. Basically, you start to do it through these new technologies. The third thing about technology is it collapses time and space. Remember when we used to take long-distance calls to Europe, used to spend all this stuff, I and mean, it took all this money, now they're free? This is the same thing that's happening. The technology collapses space, opens video channels up. We can do a lot of different things that we could never have done before. So what we've got now is a think tank world that basically is filled with these kind of institutions inside Washington. What we've got outside is all these cr incredibly amazing places coming up with these great ideas. And ultimately, what we've got to do is figure out a way to start to move those things into Washington. We need to start tapping into all the incredible places in this country that can start to move ideas into Washington and not let <laughs> Washington figure it out for us. Uh, now, 
it just happens, this is another thing, I'm actually, I left running the New Politics Institute, I'm actually thinking about a new thing that we can start to do this, it's a specific thing that later in the, whatever, over the couple of days I'd love to talk to people about. I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to say, this isn't a pie in the sky, there are some actual real people coming together, we're starting to think about how do you start to do this. But I want to end here the way I began it, with Barack's, this is our moment. Folks, this is about as historic a time in this country as any of us could possibly want to live through. It is on a par with, again, those handful times in American history. And so you've got to take into account what he's been saying. His other line that I just love about him is, we are the ones we've been waiting for. It's not like we're going to wait for Barack to figure this out or a little cluster of folks in Washington. It's we all have to figure this thing out. It's Alabama. Okay, Alabama. Okay, fine. Originally, right. But he's been hammering this in his speeches. It's like that's what's happening. And the thing is, think about this, folks. Who would you rather have on your A team than the people in the 20th century, 20, 2008 in America, man? I mean, here's just one fact. I just want to give this, give you inspiration that this is solvable. In night, when back in the New Deal, less than five percent of the country basically had college educations. Now it's up to close to a third of the country. In real numbers, this is the amount that FDR was drawn off of. 5.5 million, this is how many college, college grads we have in this country. Just a simple metric to say, we have so much knowledge, and on top of it, we have such an incredible technologies. <laughs> if you would have told FDR, hey, we're going to give you a box that you can type in a question and you get all the information <laughs> the world come back, he'd go, oh my god, it's magic. Now this is something that every five-year-old in the country does. I mean, it's like, it's huge. So to finally wind it up here, Drummond, I will say this. We are perfectly capable to basically create that globally integrated society that we basically got to get that's in balance with nature, with basically a way that we solve climate change, that basically works for the greatest amount of people, not just in this country, but across the world, that ultimately does this with a long-term view, with a big picture sustainable vision, that ultimately creates the world that all progressives have been thinking about for the longest, longest time. But to do that, to save that little planet, Figure this thing out for the 21st century. It's going to start with you. It's going to start with all of us here. It's going to start with we. And if we really don't think we're going to be able to do this, just remember one last line from Barack Obama. Yes, we can. I told you you didn't want to miss that.